our thoughts with our behavior and making sure that they're really as close together as possible. No, that's right. And when you say, I, I love how you bring up bank statements because I was thinking about my own and it's mostly for food. <laughs> it's to make sure my family's fed, but it's either at a small business restaurant here that's suffering in or at um, you know the grocery store. Right. But I've found that I haven't been spending money on all random shit that I used to just buy. Mm -hmm. I've started to really think about what's a, what do I need versus what I want just because it's changed. It's changed me a lot. It, it's kind of scary. And, and going back to showing who we are, you know, it, it is scary sometimes because we've put on this persona of who we think people want us to be. And so it's scary to break out of that mold into who we really are because we're afraid of being judged. And I know with me in the beginning, when I started to talk about my own personal journey, I've lost friends and it, and it sucks it, it, and it's hard, but I, you know, I had to realize that there are certain people that will come in my life and then we'll leave and they'll all leave some kind of imprint or I'll learn some kind of lesson. And, but that took a long time for me to realize. Mm -hmm. and, and I didn't know how to deal with that. And then after a while I said, like, you know what? The people that are meant to stay will stay. Mm -hmm. through the whole process so how did you personally deal with that kind of thing because I it, it's hard even as an adult I know as when we're younger and we lose friends it's traumatic and then as an adult you feel like oh, I don't have time for this shit but it really sings mm -hmm. it does yeah I actually was having this conversation this morning with a friend because I think it is a courageous commitment to yourself to say I'm so uncomfortable being someone that I'm not that if I lose these people, that's fine. And the trade-off would be worse if I st stuck around for something that wasn't true to me. Um, and I think most people in order to make change need to be up against such an uncomfortability that they make a change. Um, you know, I kind of call it the gift of desperation. It's the gift of feeling desperate enough in something you've created that you have to make a change. And if that means losing people along the way, that means losing people along the way because the ultimate intention is to be true to yourself. And so, you know, I know that can be really hard for parents with kids who have to put their kids first, but ultimately I still believe that if you put yourself first, then everything else falls into place. Or if you take care of yourself first, everything falls into place. Um, but in terms of your question of how I've navigated that, I have experienced that because my, I can only speak to something that might be super, some superficial to some, but like in the realm of social media, let's use that as an example. I used to be this theatrical fashion person. So most of the people that followed me were following me for that kind of content. As I've moved into coaching, there's a lot of who do you think you are? And there's a lot of like, um, unfollowing happening and a lot of rejection, but then also a lot of new people that are following that are into the new version of myself into the evolution. So yeah, you do lose the people that are not meant to be there and then you gain new ones. And I've had the same happen in close friend groups. You know, I got sober five years ago and I lost many, many people. So I understand that that I have the perspective now to look back and say that everything ends up all right when, when people leave you, but it does hurt. It does make you feel like, God, am I going down the wrong path? Am I making a mistake? Cause this person really knew me and they really, now they don't like the person I'm becoming. Or, but I think we kind of scare people when we sort of start feeling confident about who we are and moving in a direction that's good for us because we force those people to look at themselves inadvertently with that you don't I think it's you don't need to be promoting you can just be yourself and people will come and go and so you know any when I quit drinking anybody who had a drinking problem had an issue with me quitting drinking so I mean people went away you know and the people who who were com who were comfortable in their own drinking habits didn't care they were supportive so I do think we, as we evolve, we lose people and I do, and we gain people, but I think that's part of the reason why people don't change because they'd rather be comfortable in something that's not great than have the unknown confront them. The period in which you feel totally alone before the new ones come, because there's always that period. That's the scariest, you know, you make the change, things feel like you're moving. And then there's a break where you're like in between friend groups or in between, you know? Yeah. 
that's when you have to really hold on to your seat and say like, I'm, I'm going to double down on my commitment to myself. That's hard to do is to stay committed to yourself, even with all those changes. But if you just have one person the whole time, like, I think we get caught up in thinking we need more than one, but if you just have that one person that believes in what you're doing while you're believing in what you're doing, it helps you, I think, stay on course. Absolutely. No, that, that is true. You start realizing that you don't need a hundred friends. Mm -hmm. Just those, just those five that actually have been with you through the beginning and, you know, believed in you and helped you to believe in yourself. That's, I think that's what matters. And, and I wish I would have seen that <laughs> years ago, but I, you know, I think all of these experiences create or help us to uh, form the person that we are now. Yeah. And that, and that is really, when I say let's work with where people are, that's that's kind of another great tool for assessment right there. You know, like if you're someone who likes having a hundred people around you, that night may not be right or wrong. Let's just discuss why you feel like you need a large friend group. Are you someone who has difficulty getting really close to people? So large groups are better because there's less intimacy in one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. Are you there's so many different ways in which you can work with your current situation to question and to look deeply at your intentions and values. Because oftentimes I find that people who are deep are craving deep connection with people are people with a lot of friends. And I always wonder like, and I had that experience living in New York, like in a city of that many people with that many friends, I felt the most alone because I was craving something deeper than these group dynamics. And then when I started sort of weeding out all the people and got down to just a few key quality ones, all my needs were met. Because I, I was satiating and scratching that itch of what I was really looking for, which was something deeper than group dynamics. That makes sense. I, I like how you, how you dug into that because, yeah, that, that makes sense. It's hard to see, I think on an individual basis. I think you really do have to work with someone like myself or some or a friend or someone just to peel it apart and see the see the truth of it, you know? Yeah. Especially when I work with people who are struggling with weight and they have a closet full of clothes that don't fit them anymore and they're thinking, I'm gonna hang on to these because one day or I'm not gonna buy anything nice now because one day and they're never living today. And then it's like getting to the heart of those clothes with them is one of the most rewarding things because they're able to say like, I'm holding onto that dress because it reminds me of a version of myself that I wish I was. And it's like exploding that idea of saying like that dress is not who you are. And it, the idea of what it was might be excitement or my husband and the fun we had, or I felt sexy. It's then, so that dress speaks to your values of wanting to feel sexy, wanting to have fun with your husband and wanting your independent free time, for example. Mm -hmm. And then helping a woman go get those things now because we pinpointed what she wants just through that dress is like the most exciting thing because it seems so frivolous. It's a stupid dress, but it speaks to so many things that we can go out and get now in a more meaningful way at whatever size we are. And from whatever amount of money we have, we can create those things from here. Uh, yeah, I, I'm sitting here thinking about my own closet because I've gone through that. <laughs> I've <laughs> hold, I've held on to so many pieces of clothing for the one day, and then I had to realize, you know, I haven't worn this in two years. It's not going to be worn. It needs to go. Mm -hmm. And I try to find the joy in handing it off to somebody else because it's another chapter. It's a new chapter for someone else. It's a new chapter for me. It's hard. Mm -hmm. You would think you could just toss clothes out or materialistic things out but it's hard because you just you create this emotional connection mm -hmm. and it's that feeling of yeah uh so many so many things how do you so how do you help sell people now i see that you offer that on your website so how do you help people with that now so i have two different kinds of clients at the moment and i'm, I'm trying to integrate what i'm doing to help them both in a similar way, but I'm, I'm still going to 
be a stylist. So I still have magazines calling me and brands calling me and I have an agent that gets me styling work where I'll go and do a shoot for a denim company or for um, a cosmetic brand. And that will, that for, that has been my bread and butter for 15 years. And while I build the next chapter into something, morph this into the next chapter of helping people on a more one-on-one basis, that is something I'll continue to do. But it's interesting because most of the people who reach out to me for coaching and for this kind of conversation are people who care about aesthetics and care about their wardrobe or their weight or their, um, they care about the material world. And so I don't get clients that are coming to me with, extreme mental illness. I get people who are dealing with more of like fulfillment, alignment, purpose, presentation of who we are. And that's a lane that feels really true to me and feels like I have a a, a valuable background of experience in. You know, I'm on that track to get licensed as a psychologist right now. And I'm on the fence because there's, there's a lot of things that are unconventional, like working with your wardrobe to see who you are. That doesn't really fit into current modern day therapy. So I'm bridging the gap between the two. And I think it's, I I have found enough value in it this way that I think it will work and people enjoy it. So I'm just plugging along and I'm just staying committed to the goal of acknowledging that I care about how things look and I care about the material world. And then I also care about how people feel inside and getting, getting people to a place where they can help create their own beautiful life from the inside out is, is something I'm so passionate about that I know it can't not work. Yeah. It has to work, you know? No, absolutely. So, so where do you see yourself in the next five years then is to be able to bridge that gap and have it be, you know, it's going to be worldwide it's going to be known because you're going to be that person that's going to educate people and I think that's that's what's exciting but where do you see yourself well I'm working on a book um and I'm working I'd like to work with people more most of my time be spent one-on-one with people or in group settings and workshops I'm developing right now a way of doing this in a group setting um because you know people's material worlds are all different so when you get them into a room and there's everyone coming from all different walks of life it's a different conversation so right now i'm working on trying to find a way to get that to work in a group setting so i hope down the line in the next five years i have enough individual practice um, and group practices that i could be doing that full time i really love styling but there is something about helping people in this more meaningful way to me that is more fulfilling in the long run. And that's really where I see myself in the next five years is working with people one-on-one and doing workshops and, you know, having panels with people that I really enjoy listening to and just giving people the resources. Because I think like we spend money and time on our physical health and on our home and all these other things, mental health comes last. Yeah. And there's such a stigma, and you and I were talking about this before the show, there's such a stigma around taking care of your mental health, and I want to make it cool. In the same way that, you know, I think I've been able to transform clothing and make them cool, I I want to do that for mental health and make it approachable and fun for people because it doesn't have to be so dark. We can actually make this an enjoyable process, and I to get young people thinking about their mental health and people posting photos with their trainers online and take, I take care of my physical body and I'm proud of that. I'm like, why aren't we doing that for our mental health? Yes. Yes. So I can help move the cause and move the, the dial a little bit on that. You're so right. And, and I love that you're on that mission because it's true. We're so, we're quick to do everything else, but the inside, that invisible wound that no one wants to talk about, that's just not, People are still afraid. And I don't know how, you know, and you can't blame people because it's like, who wants to go sit in the past? I don't. When yeah. I do personal therapy, I am all, I have a new therapist. I'm like, I do not want to go talk about my childhood. I do not want to go sit in my stuff. I do not want to be told to meditate. I want something tangible to do. Yeah. I want something practical. And I think that's kind of where I'm filling the gap is everything I'm learning in school to become a psychologist. I'm saying, well, this is great, and this is great, and this is great, and I'm pulling from all of them, and I'm creating my own way. Because everyone can talk about 
their car, their home, the dress they have on, their new pair of shoes. They can all talk about that and you can get them comfortable there 